So I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers today, Marcia Bigelow, Ping Pang, and Alice Young, who have been working on complicating culture in Chinese language classes. Alice and Ping received the Carla um, Summer Research Assistantship this summer to work with Martha, so they're going to be them. Please welcome them. Yes, thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's a small but engaged audience. <laughs> um, I, I want to begin by thanking Carla for um, the summer funding um, that we received in order to work on these papers together. So the way this worked is um, the three of us co-taught a Star Talk Summer Institute focusing on um, teaching culture with Chinese teachers. And this institute is um, taught bilingually. Um, so I do my parts in English. I don't do it in Spanish. <laughs> um, I do, it, you know, the parts I do in English, and then um, Alice and, and Ping do um, a lot of the teaching in um, Mandarin. Oh, and English, um, both. And the students, it's a very open language policy. Everybody uses the languages that they want. But it is a space where Chinese teachers can be together, all together to talk about all things Chinese. So it's a real luxury to be able to have that um, opportunity. And we have been doing it for uh, nine years. Um, so, so Carla gave us summer funding to work on papers related to kind of our inquiry around um, our ongoing problems of practice in terms of learning to teach teachers about complicating culture. So um, another person on our, our research team was Kaishan Kam, who was also a long-term instructor um, for the Institute. And so what we um, were trying to do is, um, with teachers and, um, you know, and kind of like as interventions on ourselves as well, like um, I should say that we um, invited Cassie Gwynn, who's the author of that um, Teaching Foreign Messages for Social Justice, book with Pam Wesley and, and another co-author. She did a professional development um, session for the three of us. So like we have been trying to learn about complicating culture as we help teachers think about complicating culture. And we'll talk a little bit about um, that in a second too, what that means. So, you know, in general, we're, we want to think about culture beyond just like knowledge about people that are far away from here to um, thinking about culture as being a, very, a, a more personal experience and a more personal exploration, um, something that has to do with interculturality and self-discovery. So in our institute for many years now, we've been amplifying um, intersectionalities of culture, or cultures. Um, a lot of times we try to say cultures instead of culture, you know, just as um, recognition that culture is such a complex construct. So um, when we think about complicating culture, the way we've taught is, well, festivals vary across regions in China and in the US, how they're enacted in the US, um, across social class, gender, religion, all kinds of different things. And there's a lot of, if you think about like, you know, a star that has a lot of different inter in intersecting, you know, continua across all of these different um, cultural um, components of like, you know, what, uh, you know, if we're going to look at a holiday, like, what are all of the different um, lenses or perspectives that we might be able to look at by, um, by complicating culture. So um, this year we tried to push even further um, into thinking about transformative culture teaching that has even more of a local impact and can be more action oriented. So um, Cassie Glenn and Pam Wesley both have encouraged us to think about social justice in world language culture teaching as not just being critical or not just exploring intersectionalities or not just complicating culture, but like actually doing something and having something be um, a very personal experience for the learner. It's going to get us more of that. Okay. Um, so um, talking about complicating cultures, um, but from the theory to the um, real classroom teaching practice, there seems a gap. Um, just 
Think about one second and give me a quick response. When you're thinking about teaching Chinese culture or just hear the words, just hear the words Chinese culture or Chinese, what will come to your mind? Any kind of words or images that come to your to your mind? Just tell us quickly. Just shout out if you have a, a idea what Chinese culture or Chinese. Like what would be typical content? Yeah. Chinese New Year. Yeah. Chinese New Year. Good. Food. Food. What kind of food? <laughs> Spicy food. <laughs> <laughs> any any other um, reactions or responses? Like when you think about Chinese culture, you hear the words, something pop to you right away. That's dragons. Dragons. Way walk. Calligraphy. Tradition. Tradition. Pandas. Pandas. <laughs> so um, this is what normally comes to people's mind, right? When you look at it, maybe there's something that's not sharing in this moment. But this is what we hear, what we saw, and that's what we see when teachers try to teach culture in the classroom. Um, so to complicate culture, we mean we try to move beyond this kind of traditional way of introducing Chinese culture that actually reinforce kind of stereotype uh, for students. So they always think one dimensional of what Chinese culture is, but actually culture can be multi-dimensional. Um, so for our summer institute, we um, try to focus uh, those kind of essential questions, especially who am I as a cultural being? Because the participant in this institute, they all also carry dual um, responsibility and dual identity. They, they, they were at that moment teach uh, students, but at the same time, they, they are teachers when they go to practice. So who they are as a cultural being can really influence Most how- everybody was uh, uh -huh. a member of the Chinese diaspora community, community of some kind. So, and, and just like Ping and Alice, many of them have um, American-born um, children. So that um, was always a big topic and often very emotional, you know. So here, yeah, so these are just um, some, of the some of the essential questions that guided our, our workshops every day. And, um, oh, and assignments. The, so the, the major assignments that for this uh, institute um, will be reflection and then uh, doing a cultural growth road map at the end through those two weeks of uh, institute what kind of um, cultural learning journey that they have in school. So they have to make a, a somehow visual representation for us. This, um, this year we um, bought a lot of uh, um, paper and markers and glitter and all kinds of art supplies. And um, they, so they made um, these culture um, growth roadmaps on posters. And they added to these things um, after every class. And, and any, actually any time they felt like it. So it was like a hands-on, artsy kind of thing that could represent their learning. So that was another big um, part. And then we also had um, uh, lesson plans. And we did some micro-teaching and um, reflection every day. So they, they had to produce quite a bit. And then this was a highlight, actually, of the institute. <laughs> because normally for the iceberg, we always see the tip of the iceberg when we teach um, culture in the classroom. That's what, you know, the first picture you saw, the, the food, the, the, the uh, festivals and clothes, stuff like that. So to tap into the bottom of the iceberg, the perspectives that um, create a lot of tension for us too. So we try to help the learners make a new metaphor of what culture means. Uh, in our own uh, community. So that's the hands-on visual representation that uh, participants made at the end. This is a bunny tree. So the highlight would be wood. So the culture can extend to many ways and also go up in many ways. So this is um, our highlight. Yeah, so the, the students critiqued this metaphor for um, thinking about culture and culture teaching. You know, it's like it's just one big piece of ice, right? if this is all mushed together, whereas here we can have things that branch more um, nicely and we can have, you know, specific things on leaves up here and again more branching. And then they put like flowers and insects and birds and other things living in the tree. So it's 
much more alive and it kind of resonates culturally. The banyan tree has like a cultural um, link as well. So this was a, this was a highlight and um, this helped our pedagogy as well. I think this is something that Cassie Glenn suggested that we do. Um, so our, um, these are just three of our summer writing projects. So what we did was we got together at, um, various uh, days during the summer and we would come together and analyze uh, data together and talk about our projects together. And then we would go off and um, do our own writing and kind of go back and forth like that. It was a really um, nice luxury to be able to collaborate like that. And so these are just um, three of the papers that we're gonna be talking about today. The one that um, Kaishan Kong is taking the lead on involves the analysis of the culture growth roadmap presentations and what uh, teachers amplify as being like a lot of things, their discoveries in culture teaching and things about related, related to who they are. So um, Peng is going to take it away with her presentation on neologisms. And if you don't know what that word means, don't worry. <laughs> okay. First, I want to see what it means for neologism. So for neologism, it uh, refers to the created new words. And also, it can borrow from other languages, from the dialect, from industry language. So also, it can refer as the existing words with new meaning or new usage. So this is a neologism. And then, because neologism can, is one kind of word, it is can, we can see that from the word to word to the word. So neologism provided is a new way to observe and perceive the development of the society, the development, uh, development changes of the culture, and also we can see the psychology of the language usage. So it is have the language contact, the cultural influence, and also you can see it is related to the whole like a language and lexical development. So here are the examples for neurologism. There are multiple ways to follow the regular formation, word formation to do the neurologism. So homophonizing is a one type of a form, word formation. It can have the four ways to do that. So today I will emphasize only on the homophonic Chinese character. So this means you use the one character or one word to replace another word. The similarity is their pronunciation of sing or similar. For example, like a xie, harmonious, and a xie. It is a river crab. So they are the same pronunciation, but why we do that? So harmonious, that is uh, the kind of like a strategic uh, um, kind of advertisement for the Chinese government to try to build a democracy society. And when you, <laughs> there are some Chinese teachers uh, laughing about that. So, but when people really want to try to get their values and the social justice and the things happen. So they complain, uh, complain about the social injustice phenomenology. They were doubting or question about the government uh, political decisions. And then, so the government uh, oppressed this per the, these persons and try to remove their from the media, their word from the media. Also censor their background. So then the people are thinking a different way to like try to talk about sensitive topic. So they use the same like a pronunciation word, like 和谐, to replace the hum harmonious. And they're still talking all night. They were talking like a sensitive topic. In this way, they can avoid the government censorship of the keyword. So when you get the keyword and then you say, okay, this word a lot counted as the, like a typical sensitive like a word. And then sometimes we also say Fei Hexie. Fei is a passive like a word using to say 
uh, you can see from that it is implied about the power shift between the government and the people. Yeah. So here is some topic. So how we will see the neurologism from all the three like aspects. So we just talk uh, because this this talk is focused on the um, cultural um, content. So we also need to teach us interesting about how to link the culture with the language teaching. So from this point, we need to also like uh, help the teachers to explore how we can integrate the language and the cultural teaching together. So it is have a linguistic awareness and a literacy development going around when you talk about the topic. So we have in the institute, our teachers are very receptive. So they come up with some word that can be used in our K-12 Chinese classroom. For example, every Chinese like they use the WeChat, right? So in why we use the WeChat so we can talk with later. So WeChat can do a lot of things. So there is a teacher like a design an activity. See what we can do and the student like searching online and find out they can have WeChat read back, WeChat spot, WeChat reading, with a lot of things that WeChat advertisement, WeChat like a renting anything about that. So they first, they were listing all the words that they find students finding online and then have the color coding there. So WeChat will, uh, is written in black and the other word written in red. And when they have the red word they show the student what that means du shu and everyone know that oh du shu means reading. Okay, what means yun dong? Yun dong means spot, right? So they understand this part, and then we put a widget with the word, and then it is a compound word there. So when they have a compound word, and the student recognizes this is, oh, so when you like try to understand the word, you can put that into the separate part, and understand each part, and compound them together, because 80% of the Chinese words are compound. So from this way, it has increased their linguistic awareness. So after that, the, the instructors or the teachers can ask the students to explore why in China we only use the WeChat rather than Google or Facebook. So as a student doing that, they will recognize that because Chinese government block the Google and the Facebook and they try to like eliminate the people's freedom to, of speech and then try to build a hum, hum, harmonious societies around the earth. This is a kind of a harmonious society. So from the world, they can understand the world. They can critically, the students become the critical learners for that. So from that, we know the possibility of the teaching culture and language through the neurologism. But we still have some open questions. What is the role of the proficiency in teaching neurologism? And how we can expose students to the cultural context to the degree that they see the human irony and in the neurology. So this is my topic. Thank you. And this is a like an yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Um Because teaching for social justice is such a big umbrella. Um, um, so, from the words, and now we're coming to the teachers' practice and how the teachers uh, react to this um, critical pedagogy approach to complicate the culture. And this is my writing focus to um, analyze how the teachers react to it through their writing and the interview with them. Here are just the two activities that uh, show you uh, how the teachers would react to it. One is um, we gave them some of the scenarios to discuss, uh, for example, uh, one child policy or uh, pollution, stuff like that. And then we also, um, before that, we also gave them other activity called identity zone, um, so they can walk around the classroom, standing by the sign, for example, how do you think people judge you or you are judged by, 
for example, your look, uh, your uh, nationality, your culture, uh, your face, your age, uh, how much money you have, stuff like that. And guess what? <laughs> Um, if I if in this classroom we're all familiar with each other and you I ask you to walk around say how you get judged by your own culture your personality your look what do you think are you taking it seriously or how would you react to this activity seriously or like feel at ease or comfortable. Why don't you just tell what happened? Okay. <laughs> so I just give you a little quick because in this one, um, it, it will show the conflict that uh, how the Chinese teachers in this group react to, and how me as an instructor to give this um, activity for participants. Um, and again, I'll just jump in. Like Alice has learned a lot of these strategies through her training in um, intercultural. Um, pedagogies and cultural education. So she thought that they would work really well with the Chinese teachers too. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, <laughs> um, and then um, from you know the teachers uh, really um, didn't react to what I expect. And then uh, the reason I think is because social justice is such a big uh, term that different people de uh, define differently. So it maybe has a little confusing. So some people think um, foreign language is already halfway there. So it's easy for us to just jump in. And some people also think um, it, it's more than a, a set of skills and specific approaches. It's not, uh, approaches are not the end, should be just the start. Some people think the philo it should be teacher's philosophy and a way of being. So there's th different um, uh, definition that causes people confused what exactly we need to do as teachers in the classroom. So a, a close look at the raw data. So after those activities, we finish, and then when we talk to the teachers, they will say, there's nothing sensitive, like talking about the fake food or whatever, um, pollution, one child policy, it's not sensitive. Nothing for us is sensitive. What we think is sensitive, like, uh, race, racism, um, how much is your clothes, how much is your house. We think in, in America it's, it's sensitive, but to them, is that there's nothing sensitive. Uh, another way is how we treat what is called formal teaching and learning. They will say, tell me, uh, I need to go early if, if you are not teaching as PowerPoint and classroom discussion, lecturing, that's not be belong to teaching, so we can leave. Or, Social justice, everybody knows your America is like a slogan. Why are we talking about this? Why, why do we need to teach? How we teach that? Um, at the end, after everything finished, lots of teachers came to me and said, what is that then that you call social justice in Chinese? Can you explain? So those, you can tell there is a gap definitely between how we think teachers teach and teachers take that perspective and then practice into your own classroom. So um, from the analysis of the data that um, the, the ideas we got, the perspective is transformative cultural teaching need to come to fall. For example, school context and culture. Some people think uh, their religious schools cannot do that kind of work. Uh, student language proficiency, that's very, very common. Level one cannot do it. That's what they said. And uh, younger, younger students, uh, level one students couldn't do that. They're too young to understand what social justice means to them. We need to be more explicitly talking about that. And Chinese language is unique. There is, we need, we need examples, couple examples. Can you show me how you do that? How you teach characters with this pedagogy? Or ideological conflict between critical views and traditional Chinese cultural views. Um, and then, most, in, uh, most important to me as an instructor using this um, action research is for teachers to uh, Culturally relevant pedagogy, not just for teachers, also can be for students, uh, for, not just for students, but also for teachers. When we're doing tuning for teachers, that's also applied for them. Just like the identity zone activity, when I gave to them, my mind was set as a Western um, mind orientated. So when I apply that into the classroom, I forgot about the insider, outsider, and it didn't come to my expectation. They're all laughing and joking, and it's not a serious to them. So that's the conflict. 
um, this is uh, my part shape, and now it's the muscle I'm talking about. Well, um, so, like, just to, just to sum up, um, so King's work, I think, contributes a lot to broadening our idea, our idea about intersections between language and culture, because to understand how funny or metaphorical the neologisms are, you have to understand the cultural nuance of it, and then you can look at real language samples to see how people use it. Um, it's a kind of, it's a sophisticated kind of work to, to be able to get that. And then Alice's paper is so interesting too because like who she is becoming as a teacher educator um, draws a lot from her Western training and she's not used to working with an all Chinese group of teachers. So a lot of her assumptions um, have, there's, have been a mismatch. So um, her paper is going to be really fascinating because of um, the interplay between who she is as a teacher educator you know, and who she's becoming because obviously you want to be able to teach that kind of a group that's all Chinese. Like you want to be able to connect with them. So that was, it, it, yeah, it, it, and like it's different every year, but you know, even in the past, we have run into quite a few taboos. So that one quote, like nothing is taboo, that's like not been my experience either, right? <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then like kind of being, um, Blase or even a little oppositional to talking about more critical things with Chinese teachers is a, is a big challenge. So um, my paper um, is I've got I've got two working titles. One is Neoliberal Discourses in Foreign Language Learning: Why Learn Chinese, and my other option is the Politics of Chinese Teaching in a Neoliberal Area Era: The um, Chinese Teachers. So um, I've been long bothered by um, the discourse around which language people should study. Like, what is a valuable language to study? And you know, in our professional world, we think even small languages are valuable to study, right? Um, it's great to study Ojibwe. It's great to study, you know, very small languages, right? And so this discourse, like, you should study Chinese always centers around money, right? Or professional advancement or things like that. So um, um, th this, it, this, this bothers me a lot, but I know that a lot of the teacher candidates that I work with, and you guys, of course, and um, anybody that teaches Chinese, you feel pressure to make an argument to either parents or students that there is gonna be like, uh, cash reward of studying Chinese in the future of some kind, right? Like this, there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between like, you know, how well you speak Chinese and how much money you make in China, right? Something like that. Who, I, I haven't really updated this paper since like the pending trade wars, so that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> but um, so I talked with uh, three teachers about this. And um, let me just give you a little, uh, a couple snippets of what they had to say. So Margaret um, teaches here in Minnesota. She's a white middle-aged woman. Um, she uh, learned Chinese um, as an adult living in Taiwan. King um, was a teacher uh, in LA, and she was a high school Chinese and physics teacher. So Margaret was teaching in kind of an affluent sort of school game, a high poverty school in LA. And I thought it was cool that she was Chinese and physics teacher. And she, um, she came into that school as a Hanban teacher. And then um, um, Yu is from Illinois. He's a high school Chinese teacher. And, he's, um, and he is in a, um, a more urban um, school district. And um, his, his, anyway, all three of them have different stories. I'm going to talk mostly about Margaret and King because they have um, two opposing stories. So, um, I'm just going to read a few quotes from the data here. Um, so, this is what Margaret says I studied Mandarin to become a professor, a scholar. I was going to be the next John King Fairbanks or Pearl Buck. This was my dream. My motivation was totally scholarly. And when I asked her if she encountered students like her, she said, I can't think of a one. Margaret explained that there had been a shift in the past five to 10 years. She noticed that undergrads are majoring in subjects that 
um, they think will make money. She understands it's partly due to the high cost of higher education and the pressure students have to acquire skills that will guarantee employment. She says, students go to school to get a job, so the days when you know we would be able to assume um, uh, uh, human take do a humanities major for hope seem to be gone, really. And I can see that with my students. I usually end up feeling like a failure, be failure because I'm trying to teach the culture and the values. Then the students ask, how do you say insurance in Mandarin? How do you say shipping? in Mandarin. How do you say finance? And I say, please don't ask me to teach you those words. And she says that laughingly. Um, when I asked her about her high school students' parents' views about Mandarin, she explained that parents make Mandarin part of a pre-professional thing for their children. Margaret laments that this mindset seems to overshadow other reasons or benefits for studying um, Mandarin. She says, quote, if they are not heritage speakers, the parents are really ambitious. They're not necessarily pushy, but they push, push their kids. There's a word in Mandarin, jing, jing sheng, which means frenetic. Can you say that? Yeah. <laughs> um, for the Chinese teachers. These poor kids, you know, um, uh, taking all honors classes and then Mandarin, there's just a pattern of an ambition behind taking Mandarin. So when the parents talk to me, they always ask how their child is doing, but you can see that Mandarin is really a pre-professional thing. It's part of a professional plan. They all believe this is going to be good for me for my career. This is going to be good for my profession. I think that all teachers are seeing that shrinking mindset. So Margaret's experience really illustrate a, a, a mismatch between like how she became a Mandarin speaker and why she is in the field versus the pressures of who she's supposed to be in the classroom. And, um, and she's getting this maybe not only from the um, students, but also from, um, from their parents. And then, um, and then in the case of, um, King, this is uh, her, st her st story is totally different, and um, unbeknownst to her, she has fallen into uh, kind of like an American race politics debate. So she came as a Hanban teacher from China, and um, she said, "Well, the assistant prof uh, principal said, what kind of free teacher can I get?" And so. Um, so the decision to offer Chinese was partly about who can, you know, who can we get for free? And he thought, maybe I can get a free Chinese teacher. Um, and um, he was able to do this despite teachers being laid off and even um, uh, teachers uh, being sent home because of teachers' union, teachers union issues with hiring them. So while, um, so she's in this uncomfortable position of being brought on while other teachers are getting laid off. And then she also says that um, the assistant principal wanted to offer Mandarin. And I said, well, why? You know, this is kind of my research question. Why Mandarin? She says, we have Spanish. We have French at the location already. And apparently, they were not doing it successfully because most of the kids, 80% are Latino. They already speak Spanish, so with the Spanish, there is a lot of black and brown issues, she said. The other 20% are black students. So she explained that um, many of the black students did not want to learn Spanish because of racial tensions in the school between the Latino and the black students. And Chinese was like the neutral zone. Like, it was a way of dealing with the black and brown issues. And this is, she's like, trying to ex um, explain the reasoning that the, um, the principal used. Um, so she says, a grammatically different language, vastly different language and cultural, um, culturally different language re um, create a different perspective. And also I, the IB program is supposed, is supposed uh, was international and that Asian piece was missing. He chose to keep Mandarin because he saw value. Mandarin does not trigger the black brown issue. He saw the value of how these Asian people flourish and all the arts, medicine, everywhere. Asian American like model minority stereotypes. 
Let's study them. We had this teacher um, share this experience with the kids. He saw me, he saw my work ethic, and that kind of confirmed that model minority. So she even used that, that word too. Um, so when I asked King about like, well, you know, why, why are you um, teaching Chinese? What motivates you? And she, she couldn't care less about, um, you know, the, the neoliberal discourses. Even for her, that really wasn't a big part of the discourse that she was working in in her urban school in LA. It was all the like racial things going on. And, um, and then the like uncomfortable um, position of her being this um, free teacher while you know there were other teachers that were being let go. And, um, and what she said was, I, I'm just doing this because I love the children. I just want to be with the students. And I, she would say over and over again how she thought that it, it was kind of her role to like bring the world to the students. And she, I have a nice part in her interview where she said, you know what, they didn't know what hummus was. And so we all ate hummus. <laughs> and that has nothing to do with Chinese <laughs> culture. But for her, culture was connecting with the students. And um, she uh, said she got her physics students interested in taking Chinese, and she got her Chinese students interested in taking physics. Because she was, she was that person that they liked. And so she, for her, um, culture teaching had to do with relationships. Um, just very briefly, the other um, the other teacher, um, his story was that the um, his principal had lived in uh, had been like a you know uh, an administrator in China for a few years, and so he wanted Chinese because um, he just like was aware of that part of the world. And he's like, we're gonna offer Chinese just because you gotta know something about Asia. And it was a big you know, part, like he understood how valuable that would be. So that was part of his rationale. Another interesting political thing in that district was that um, they were looking for non-native Chinese speakers to be the teachers. And um, this guy, um, Yu, he was, hoping even to try to uh, recruit a woman who was an African-American Chinese speaker to his program because he also felt like having non-native um, Chinese speakers as role models for the kids was a really good thing. And he tells a lot of other stories that have nothing to do with making money in China, but more about like, let's just travel outside of the city with the kids and have like an experience in a city nearby um, that is somehow cultural and we can ex explore self that way. So it's not just about festivals like that in China, it's about like exploration. So anyway, that's what my paper, um, or I should say the paper I'm taking the lead on. We all are like sharing the ones we're taking the lead on. All of us are co-authors. So that's um, the gist about what um, I am like. And um, just to um, wrap up, we're still trying to convert a lot of what we're learning in our analyses to what it means for future teaching, for curriculum and assessment, for thinking about teachers' um, uh, work, own identity work, and, and many other things. So thank you uh, for listening to our uh, short trailer spiels. And uh, we have a, a little bit of time for questions. And probably um, clarification because we kind of went fast. So, have you um, considered? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious about whether or not the what the teachers have learned in this in this institute that they do is impacting their teaching. Mm -hmm. Have you considered at all whether to follow up with them or you know kind of branch out a little bit in terms of whether or not they're doing anything differently in their teaching as a result of the work that you've done with them? Um, we haven't been good about keeping a in touch except through WeChat and before that um, Facebook. So do you have any anecdotes? We, still we haven't done anything systematic, so no. But. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, when we started the program, we, we created a WeChat, like a, a Facebook group chatting, so everybody was in it. And even after the program was finished, uh, we still had questions back and forth, having this relationship keep going. Um, I actually was thinking about after a while, I will 
finish the after I finish the paper, I can talk, ask a follow up questions through this WeChat group. So thank you. That's that's a good. Yeah. I, I I do that to send the poster survey because I do a pre survey and then have the like a video record for the teachers discussion and the hour discussion. So last time Alice helped me to do that and then analyze the, about their discussion to see their transformative yeah. study. Most of our data is just what happened during the institute like that, not after. Yeah, but then like a like in the master's office, we just don't talk about maybe how to see, for example, like a neurological, and we can see some teachers, they are willing, would need like to like teach neurological in our classroom to have some data. What we need are, um, are examples of these new ideas. Um, so, at Alice and Tina both in the classroom right now. So that might be a place I am, I'm actually doing it for, for myself because teachers kept asking, give me a concrete example, who did that in Chinese? Because most of the examples are Spanish and yeah. French and a little bit uh, Arabic, right? So I created a new course just called uh, Teaching Chinese Through Social Justice in my high school that I'm teaching right now. So the whole course is students and I co-constructed, um, we're doing it. And I use CBI as a free, uh, big framework, and then um, through the lens of social justice using critical pedagogy. So I'm doing that work. See how that turns out. So far, so good. I feel like you know we're all a work in progress too. All of us. You know, we are 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 still trying to try to learn, <laughs> figure it out. And, and the neologisms is a totally new thing. And Alice's techniques that she used this summer were very new to this population. I know you allow the teacher's training, teacher, you really want to have some practical takeaways. So what are some practical takeaways um, the teachers got from this program that they can feel like they're comfortable to use right away in their classroom? Well, they have to write some lesson plans that um, demonstrate that they can integrate language. But some of them um, did latch on to the um, neologisms. There was a lot of excitement about it and a lot of laughing. <laughs> so we, we do have, for example, like our teachers also ask about them, like the analysis and AP reading. So when they come a new logic, then we have some, for example, I have one new accent and we ask them. So they first say, oh, new logic is kind of like a survive language when I bring my student to China right now. And suddenly they switch the topic. Oh, so whether the neurologist can give the bonus point for the AP test, you know how this kind of moment you can say, aha, uh -huh. so this is related to their background knowledge. Also, it can show their like, thinking about how to integrate the language into the cultural learning or the culture into the language. And then, so they are like we have the Giving the teachers uh, maybe not give it has facilitated the empowerment to the teacher. They explore the way to do that, and then finally they have the lesson plan they take away from from the institute and bring to their classroom. Yeah. I mean, some of the major um, things that we hope they take away is um, like to stop essentializing Chinese culture, right? Like stop doing that. We hope that they won't do that after we like talk about it, you know, so much. Um, we uh, we also hope that they will use more authentic materials when they teach culture. So, but those I feel like those are like interventions of, of sorts that we hope hopefully we had during the institute, and we hope that, that you know we see a lot of transformation in the way they think based on the you know summative assessment. I was just thinking there are several uh, concrete ways that they take right away. One is uh, assi one assignment that they had every day is called um, toolkit. 
So everybody has to share one tool, specifically teaching culture in the classroom with everybody. So we built that on, on the Google Docs. So everybody has to share and learn as a group. That's one concrete one they can use right away. Strategies, activities, um, singing, whatever. And the second one is um, critical thinking that behind the surface culture. For example, we had a panel talking about um, learning beyond the classroom, uh, taking trips overseas or here, but then not just going to Great Wall, but we can go to Tibet, we can think about different areas that's not uh, mainstream Chinese culture that focus on. So this is one another one. And Alice has led those kinds of trips that don't aren't just like the five star. Uh, yeah. Some of, the off -track, track. some of the off-track um, trips that we take and so help them to think about critically and also uh, critical literacy really we did uh, an analyze for how you look at this picture from different angle and talk about different perspectives any comments two more questions <laughs> you no, you go ahead <laughs> he's different she's different uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the social justice, I mean, it's very, very easy, and there are so many, uh, so, I mean, the, the teacher has to write articles, I mean, all of these, if they, I mean, uh, for beginners, of course, the media, then it's hard for them to read the uh, authentic materials. So, but by read, we mean, like, read a picture. Like it, it might not even have words on it. Right? Authentic materials can be like objects. Right. For example, recently there is uh, one thing everybody in China knows. Um, yeah. yeah. She kind of, what how do you say that is she refused to pay she tried to avoid paying tax. She's a big uh, movie star. Mm -hmm. And she avoided paying taxes. And they accumulated for a number of years, uh, and in the end, uh, yeah, actually, uh, there was uh, more than 250 million the tax amount that she, she not, did not pay. And then there was a one person who, who used to be a TV uh, anchor, and he was brave enough to expose this. By now, he has been, he has received a lot, a number of life threats. Death threats? Uh, and life threats. So, this is social justice, by the way. Because we, have, uh, we know other people who just, uh, I mean, who did some business, but uh, did not fail to pay, pay tax with a much smaller amount. So here's a question. question. Yeah. Do you think that the Chinese teachers would be uncomfortable with that story? I don't know. What in the US you can talk to teach that. But in China, I don't know where that is. So actually that is cultural learning. Two is um, what topics are taboo in China versus what topics are taboo here. I mean that would be an interesting in the widespread in, in social media, though, although not in uh, official media. But in social media, everybody knows it and it's widespread. Mm -hmm. So, for some who avoided to pay so much, hundreds of millions, got, got, I mean, got out. We got, I, I can see we, we are saying anything. <laughs> Another remember, question. Let's take it. <laughs> so, how would you incorporate some of these ideas for like a beginning class or even for like younger? Oh, I'm doing that one um, because we give um, teachers um, tools to use. One of the things we use is called uh, teaching for tolerance standard. So that will K to twelve. Are you are you familiar with those? It's um yeah teaching. teaching uh, Teaching, uh, teaching, teaching, yeah, tolerance. teaching tolerance, also for and teaching for And there's a, a set of social justice standards for K-12. Um, like the example for older kids for taking responsibility, paying your tax, right? For so you can you can um, simplify it as taking your responsibility, stuff on the young one. Uh, who is going to 
wash the dishes today. Who is going to put away your your chairs in like this kind of? So came from you know tailored to different levels and tailored to different language proficiency. That's my understanding. Even like a kind of simple topic we can go deeply. Google Images for everything Joan. So it's like a, a, a okay. facial expression. Oh, like embarrassed. It means like embarrassed, you know. Yeah. So this is a new logic and we call it Joan. First, then, like in the Asian meaning, it's a window. And then, so right now, people like a new logic, there is a one characteristic is it can refer the existing word using with a New meaning or new usage. So this is qualified for that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.